My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. My name is Dorian from group82university.com, basketballceo.com, and basketball is a love language for me. How I got hired at Mount Verde Academy. You know, Mount Verde Academy is one of the, ain't no one of, they are the best high school basketball program in the country. For those of y'all that are watching, I might be sweating a little bit, so I'm going to be wiping my head, and a fly keeps running around here, and I can't run in. Flying around here, and I can't catch him. Anyway, Mount Verde basketball is the best high school basketball program in the country. You got Ben Simmons, who they came out of there. You got D'Angelo Russell. You got... Uh, guy Casey Hill, who I coach, you got RJ Barrett, you have all these guys who have came through Mount Verde, who have elevated that program to be the premier high school property in the United States of America right now. If you are one of the top 10, 15, 20 kids in the country, Mount Verde has probably reached out to you or you are on their radar and they are about to. This is things that I didn't know in 2009 when I moved to Orlando, Florida. I moved to Orlando, Florida to be the graduate assistant with the University of Central Florida men's basketball team, UCF. At the time, the head coach was Kirk Spiroff. You know, I ain't really know him like that. But over the years of me, years, it was like a year and a half of me kind of meeting people and having a little bit of a basketball network, I was able to get in touch with Micah Byers, who was the director of basketball operations at UCF at that time. Now, back in 2008, no, here, here go this damn fly. Now, back in 2008, 2009, social media really wasn't like how it is now. We have Facebook and Twitter was starting to warm up, but, you know, coaches definitely weren't using social media. It was still very face-to-face -face and hopping on the phone. You might get somebody to respond to you via email. Michael was one of the guys who responded to me via email, told him I was coming to graduate school. I got into the program. I want to be a graduate assistant. He said, cool, come down. You'll be a graduate assistant. Everything's going to be love. Hooty wooty woo. So I moved. At the time, I'm coaching at Lee's McRae College in Banner Elk, North Carolina. Our team is 2-29. and 29. But it was the, one of the best years of coaching I ever had because it was my first assistant coaching job. I got to recruit. I got to go on the road. I got to develop players. I got to draw up things in meetings and watch video. Like I was able to really get after it when I was at Lee's McRae and Thanks to Scott Polsgrove for giving me that opportunity. But I knew I was ready to go. So when I moved down to Orlando after I got into graduate school, I had three things lined up because I knew that at this point with this business, nothing is guaranteed. I had the UCF GA situation. I had met a man, his name was Shay Robinson, and he had been a trainer under D. Brown, who used to play for the Boston Celtics, played in the NBA for a minute, played at Jacksonville University in college. I think he won a 1991 slam dunk contest. He had the Reebok pumps. That was the first time we actually saw the pumps. Shout out to Reebok. They had crazy market share, and they knew the culture at that time. Fell off when they started doing, like, Tybo and women's fitness. No offense to that, but completely different market. And D. Brown at the time, he was training kids. And now I look back on it, his daughter, Alexis Brown, who plays in the WNBA, she was younger. So he was training her, her teammates, her friends, whatever, and Shay was a part of that. It was primarily women's basketball, but I knew that this would be an opportunity if I got down to Orlando. They got a dream. I mean, they got a dream. They got a facility. They got a team. They got a training regimen. I know I can get down there and I can be a trainer and learn how to do that and network through that. So that was my second option. And my third option was the option I really wanted, and that was to be a video coordinator with the Orlando Magic under Ahmad Ajami. He was a video coordinator at that time. I had emailed and called every single video coordinator in the NBA. They knew me by email, brand, and name. Ahmad was one of the guys who kept reaching out to me or kept responding to me. And so I told him I'm coming down there. He was like, hey, man, you know, hit me up when you get here so I go over to UCF for the very first day of us going to become graduate assistants and it's me Alton Clark Alton Dorian Clark and JP Clark and so I didn't know JP from Joe Blow but JP was the son of Bo Clark who was the all-time leading scorer in UCF at the time, and the grandson of Torchy Clark, who was the coach of Bo Clark when he became the all-time leading scorer, and the gym on campus was named after him. So you're talking like basketball pedigree, like three generations, same last name, but I don't have any of that. My dad worked for the FAA, was in the Air Force, and I don't know nothing about my grandfather because they were non-existent in my life. And so this is what 
I have. And we're walking in to the exact same situation. Alton Clark and J.P. Clark. And when we get in there, because me and J.P. are on the same graduate program, we call each other, walk in, the lights are low. And I'm like, this is a basketball office. Why are the lights so low? And Micah, this is my first time meeting him. I never seen him face to face. He walks out. He's like, hey, guys, hey, hey, Alton, JP, how you doing? Whoop -whoop. And I could tell that him and JP had already kind of talked and knew each other a little bit, you know. So he pulled me outside, and Micah said to me, he was like, hey, man, you know, um, one of our players who's on our team, he caught a blood clot in his leg today. And so this ain't going to be a good time to, like, talk to coach, introduce you to coach and all that because we all trying to figure out what we want to do with this. And I'm like, damn, all right, you know, I'll come back tomorrow, you know, let y'all handle that, wooty wooty woo. And I left. And I noticed that JP lingered a little bit, but, you know, I ain't think nothing of it. I just moved to Orlando. I'm going back to my apartment by myself. Ain't got nothing to do. No social circle. Class is only once a week. So I'm back in my little hole. But when I came back the next day, I was talking to Mike, and I'm ready to get going. Like, I'm coming from being a Division II assistant coach. Like, I'm ready to get after it. And he has the assistant video coordinator come out. His name is Todd Lewiston, and Todd was volunteer. And I knew Todd a little bit because I think we had worked at camp together or something. So we would exchange messages, and Todd was cool. A little quirky, but he was cool. Anybody that works in coaching, you know what I mean by, like, the little quirky support staff members that's cool. That's exactly who Todd is. Shout out to Todd. And – Todd pulled me and JP outside. He said, hey, man, you know, um, the guy that caught the blood clot, you know, he's not going to be able to play this season. And we got to find a way to get him a spot on his staff. That way he can finish his degree. And so we're going to be reduced one graduate manager spot, graduate assistant spot. So here's the application to the rec center to hold y'all over in the meantime, and then we'll let y'all know what is going to be. And he literally handed me an application to the rec center to work at the UCF rec center. I'm like, the hell? And then I went home, and then the next week we're in class, and, you know, I ain't heard from him. I had no calls or nothing. And I talked to JP, and JP, I'm asking him what he's doing. He's like, man, you know, hey, man, yeah, I, I was in there with Mike the other day, and I was talking to Coach Spiral and Wooty Wooty Whoop. I'm like, okay, all right, you know. And this is no knock on JP. JP was phenomenal. That's my guy. But he, in an emergency situation, he had to lean on his pedigree. His dad was a coach at Flagler College at the, at the time. His grandfather, like I said, it was named after him, the gym on campus. So, he had to lean on his pedigree to make sure that he was protected. He was still in there. He was able to become a graduate manager. Me, I had nothing. So they just stopped calling me and stopped talking to me. All right, that's cool. Plan number two. So I hit up Shay Robinson the next day. And I tell Shay exactly what happened and all that. He's like, cool. Because I know you're trying to get to the league anyway. So the way that you can get to the league is way easier for you to just train because you're going to be able to have a lot more fluidity, wooty woo He said, you can start coming out here next week. I said, bet. It was a Wednesday. So that next Monday, I was going to start training with Shay and D. Brown. Sunday night, I'm watching NBA TV. On the ticker at the bottom, it says, D. Brown accepts head coaching job with G League Springfield Armor. Now, if you in basketball, you know the name D. Brown also could have meant to D. Brown that went to the University of Illinois. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know what? Maybe that might be him, but he was about the same age I was. I'm 25. I do not think that he is going to be the coach of the Springfield Armor. He's probably trying to play. So I do what I didn't want to do, which as I go to Google and I type in D. Brown Springfield Armor, and sure enough, it's the 1991 slam dunk champion Reebok Pumps, D. Brown. He's moving to Springfield, Massachusetts. I call Shay. I'm like, yo, what's, what's up? Like, what's going on? He was like, man, I don't even know. I'm out of a job. So there goes plan B. So now I'm going to plan C, which is what I want to do anyway. I emailed Ahmad. 
Ajami. I said, hey, man, I'm down here. I'm in Orlando. I got my own spot. I'm in grad school. Y'all ain't even got to worry about paying me. They're the RDV Sportsplex is where the Orlando Magic headquarters was at that time. I lived in Winter Park, so it was like a 20, 25-minute drive. It wasn't far from me at all. And I said, bro, I'm ready to work. It was like September. I said, I'm ready to get after it. So whatever y'all got, let me know. I'm ready to work. He hit me back. He was like, a free intern? Absolutely. He said, I'm about to go talk to Otis, the GM. Otis Smith, who played at Jacksonville University and was at that time one of like maybe three or four black GMs in the NBA. He's the GM of the Orlando Magic. Ahmad, two days later, called me. He said, uh, Alton, what's up, man? He said, uh, you know, I went and talked to Otis, and he said that it would be a liability because of the insurance. And I'm just like, all right, man, thank you. We get off the phone. I have a BlackBerry Touch at the time. I take it. And I shove it, toss it right across my apartment, right up against the wall, hit the wall hard. Thought my phone was broke, but, you know, God didn't want me to break my phone. And I dropped to my knees right in that moment. And I asked God, I asked Lord, I said, why did you send me here? Why did you send me to Orlando, man? All three of my plans fell through. What is it? Just let me know. That next Tuesday, we have class. And we're lined up in alphabetical order. And so you have Alton Clark. The next seat's for J.P. Clark. He wasn't there that day because he had UCF, GA, basketball stuff to do. And next to him was Natalie Clark. But since J.P. wasn't there, it was me and Natalie. And so me and Natalie started talking. And it was, uh, I think it was like the first week of October at this time. And she said, Alton, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I'm thinking I might go sell cars or something because it was a it was a Lexus dealership around my apartment, and I had just got out of like sales. I had worked at Sprint, I had worked at uh, a dismissed clothing store called Backrack Indianapolis, was 100% commission sales, and that was like mm, maybe a year and a half prior. So I was still kind of in that mode where I was like, shit, I just go work in sales, and Lexus was right there. Like I can drive a Lexus, I can sell cars. My Saturday's gonna be open now. I can do that. And she said, um, Have you thought about coaching high school? And up to that point, I, did, I didn't want to coach high school. But I had nothing else. I said, Natalie, I coach anywhere right now. And she said, well, you know, I used to go to Montverde Academy. I'm like, what the hell is Montverde Academy? She likes this private school. She says, like, 45 minutes from here. I'm like, what? A 45-minute drive? <laughs> she said, but I know the coach there. You want to coach high school. Hey, could be something there. I was like, all right. So she gave me the coach's email, and I emailed the coach. His name's Kevin Sutton. So I emailed him. I let him know. Natalie knew the situation. He said, cool, absolutely. Come on out. We're having an open gym. Come out, watch, wooty woo. I drive 45 minutes, three different toll roads. And at the time, I'm in graduate school. I'm broke, okay? I'm living off of student loan money. So these toll roads is, you know, it's like $4, $5. I ain't had no money total. And so I get out there, finally, and when I pull up, I'm like, man, I ain't never coming out here again. It's entirely too far. And it looked like, you know, for lack of a better word, it looked like a plantation. It looked like they put a school in the middle of a plantation. It was very well manicured. It was a nice campus. I see what was going on. But it's in a part of Florida, central Florida, that, you know, doesn't have a lot of residents in that area until you get to, like, the Claremont area. So I don't know what I'm walking into. I hadn't even heard of a Mount Vernon Academy. I ain't know who Kevin's son was, whatever. I walked through the front doors of the gym, and they got all their jerseys and their trophies. You know, this is pretty much any school that you go to. That's what it's going to be. And But it's like a brick wall, so you got to walk around to get to the gym. So as I'm walking around to get to the gym, I stop, and right there is the head coach of LSU, John Brady, it was Matt Doherty, who was the head coach of SMU at that time, the head coach of Niagara, I can't remember his name, and Nate James, the assistant coach at Duke. All right there. And when I walked in, I didn't know what Kevin Sutton looked like. 
But I think he knew because of who I was, who, the way I looked, and I was just lost and stuff. He was like, Alton, what's going on, man? He walked up to me and gripped me and hugged me as if he had known me for 20 years. And he said, oh, y'all come in the office. And I was about to sit out there. He said, Alton, come on. And so he brought all the coaches in the office. He brought me in the office. And he just started talking about the program and talking about what they had going on and who you should look at and whoop de whoop and, and I'm just at the time just like sizing up and looking around like, yo, what is this? And then once we get out of office, I'm sorry, we're sitting in the office and then the players get out of class. When the players get out of class, every single player comes to the office, shakes everybody's hand in there, introduce themselves, every single one. I'm not just talking about varsity, JV and middle school. So I'm like, what kind of operation is he running around here? This is some sort of sweatshop, Nike everything. Like, it's probably where they make the shoes. Once we get out of the office, the office is like, you know, hidden, kind of back area. You walk out and like the stairs for where everybody sits, the stands is right here. You can see the floor. And right when you get to the floor, you see the basket. You turn to the left and on the far end at that basket, you see the wall. And at the wall up there, they had the national championships. They had who was the player of the year. And they had who went to what colleges. And he had a long list of this massive, massive banner. And I remember, I don't remember the, the kid's name on there, but I remember the very first school that they had a commitment from was Michigan State. And the second name was Luke Bob Mute, UCLA. Now, me being an NBA guy, I knew who Luke Bob Mute is. I'm like, oh, this is one of them international schools where all these Africans come from. And I'm just thinking about all the stuff I thought about and knew over the years, air up there and all that. But, yes, it was an international boarding school. Yes, they had people from all over the world. But this is a different situation. Every kid grabbed the ball, and they started going through their own workout and their own stretching on their own while he was talking to us. And then he got done talking to us and went out there and picked up right where the captains left off and he led the best group workout I had ever seen. And I was like, yeah, I see what this is. So now I'm excited. I'm like, oh, man, this might be it. So I walk up to him after practice. We start talking, whoop de whoop And um, he was like, come back out here tomorrow. You want me to drive all the way back out here again tomorrow? So I drive, pay that $4 to go back home, sit about, sit there, think about it. I ain't got nothing else to do. And the next day I wake up, and I think practice is at like 3. I leave my house at 2 because it's like an hour away. And I'm driving, man. And I'm trying not to take the toll roads. I'm trying to take the city roads. And I stop at like 6 lights. And I get to my 6 light. I'll never forget this. I'm at the 6 light. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, I got 30 minutes before I get there. I'm going to get there right on time. I'm like, man, I ain't about to do this every day. And I whipped, you turned my car and started headed back home. And I drove for about eight seconds. And I heard God say, turn around and go to my bird. I was done. I wasn't going to go. But I was obedient. And I turned around, I went, and I drove the extra 30 minutes, and I got out to my bird. And as soon as I walked in, he shook my hand. He said, you see that kid over there? It's a big seven foot one Nigerian kid. I said, Yeah. He said, Go over there and take him through an individual workout. Post. I was like, All right. Because he was working out the perimeters, he was working out the guards. So I was like, Okay, I'll work out. His name was Ugo. And I took Ugo through an individual workout. I was coaching him, and I was telling him, you know, when you grab the ball, you put it up by your face. Sorry. Put it up by your face, throw the jump hook. You know, all these things that I had been taught, even though I'm six foot, I knew this stuff about being a post player. Because my dad, <laughs> ironically, when I was younger, he was developing me as a post player, even though my height it is what it is. But I appreciate him doing that. And as I was coaching and as I was talking, I was looking back at Sutton a little bit. And every time I look back at him, he was talking to the perimeters. He was talking to the guards. So I was like, he ain't even really paying attention. We got done to individual workout. Ugo went and joined the perimeters. They ended practice. And I was about to go. And I saw when I was walking out, a bunch of little kids walked in. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? He said, oh, after I get done with the varsity, we got to do lower school ball. I said, well, who's here to help you? He's like, man, I got it. It's just me. And I'm looking, it's like 25 kids. I'm like... Man, I stay and help you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't got nothing else to do, and I helped him. So I started helping him with the lower school ball workout. We got done with that for about 45 minutes. 
His parents came and picked him up, and he was shutting down the gym, locking the door. We walked out together. He said, um, you know, my eyes might be looking at one thing, but I hear everything. And I heard what you were over there telling Ugo. And I'm like, oh, shit. He about to fire me before I even get a job. He said, everything you've been telling him, that you were telling him, is stuff that we've been telling him for years. You know what you're talking about. You know what you're doing. I got an eye for talent. My coaching staff right now, I have seven assistants. You would be number eight. So I don't know how whether that benefits you. But I will tell you this. I can't pay you. But everybody, and he tapped his pocket, he pulled his phone out. He said, everybody who's in this, I can give to you. Whenever that they call me and say that they want me, I'm going to give the phone to you. If you do what you did with Ugo today for the rest of the, of the season, I promise by the end of this year, everybody that's in my phone that works in college basketball or does something in college basketball or in basketball in general, they will know your name. I had no choice. I liked it. I liked him. and I liked how straightforward and honest that he was. I said, okay, I accept. And I got hired right there as assistant number eight. By the end of the year, I had started our social media. Montverde had no social media before I got there. I saw our social media, our Twitter. I was constantly upgrade, updating everybody on our schedule, updating everybody on social media, updating everybody on our results, updating all the coaches, and people started following, started getting a little bit of a, of a following on there. Also, what I did is I took – I. With, I, I basically introduced the advanced an, an, uh, analytics. And the reason I'm stammering and all that, because I'm really trying to think about how to describe it. We call it points for possession. But what I really did is I logged every single possession and what happened. And I used my own acronyms and my own code or whatnot that I learned from Lisa McCray and Scott Polsgrove to be able to live log possessions while we're playing. So I could see like, hey, coach, we ain't scored in six possessions. Hey, coach, we ain't got a free throw in four possessions. Hey, coach, we got five straight stops, you know. And these are things that I would yell out and things that they didn't have before because this is high school basketball ball so I made myself an asset immediately so I went from assistant number eight to assistant number two in about two weeks because I was in graduate school I was ready to work I had all the time in the world we only had class once a week and I basketball is a love language for me and he saw that and even more so the players saw that and because I was 25 I was the youngest coach on staff these dudes are 17 18 years old our, that age gap ain't that big. We listen to the same music. We dress in the same. We talk in the same. But because I'm in graduate school and Sutton kept elevating me and making them see like this is somebody who y'all should look up to, I was able to have an authoritative voice on what ended up being the number four ranked basketball team in the country that year. We played on ESPN five times. We went undefeated in the new year after January 1 all the way into the national championship game when we lost to Finley Prep with Corey Joseph and Tristan Thompson. And I took all of that momentum and everything that happened with Montverde, and I used that to catapult my career going forward. And Kevin Sutton made good on his promise. Everybody who came through the Montverde, they talked to me. All these coaches took me out to lunch because they wanted to take him out to lunch. You had to talk to me if you wanted to get near the players. And it was like that for the entire two years that I was there. And even to this day, me and Kevin Sutton still have a great relationship because we're open, we're honest, we're transparent, and we're direct with each other about how we feel and about how things are in this business. I moved to Orlando. I didn't even know what Montverde Academy or Kevin Sutton was. And now I couldn't imagine my life had I not had that experience. Always be obedient. Always listen to God. He's never going to steer you wrong. I'm out the pond. Y'all stay true. Oh, no.